It's a joy to be here. He's right. We never met till just a few minutes ago right over there. And my first question was, why would you ask someone to come preach in your pulpit you've never met before? <laughs> and then he wanted to tell me that people from Pennsylvania were recommending me. And I thought, brother, you ought to know better than that. I mean, <laughs> can any good thing come out of Pennsylvania? And so... Uh, Amen. We've had a, some good times out there at the Mount Zion uh, Baptist camp out there, and uh, kind of uh, Chris Starr and, and his groupies are out there, and uh, and uh, good groups of churches. Uh, first time they called, I didn't know who they were, and tried to get some reference point, and wanted me to come preach. And then uh, uh, they said that they put on their own camp, and I hate to say that, it was just a handful of churches we put our own camp on. And I, I hate to say this, I hate to be this way, but. In my experience, that usually means subpar, rinky-dink. I, I almost dreaded going. I'm going to tell you something. I showed up, and that was one of the sharpest camps I've ever been to in all of my life. They just put it on out there. Brother, I'm really disappointed. How do you not know where Jasonville, Indiana is? <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, we got 1,500 people. <laughs> we've, we've got a stoplight. We've got a stoplight. I mean, it's really cool. It's got all three colors. <laughs> a little place you can pull off the side and take pictures of it. It's really, I, I just shocked. I'm in a state of shock that people don't know where Jasonville, Indiana is. We've been blessed to be there. And I, I love rural America. I love small town America. And uh, we have had a time down there. And it's a great place to raise a family. And uh, I tell our young preacher boys, please don't just dismiss the idea that God may want you to pastor in a rural setting. You know, rural people need the Jesus too. And you may not uh, be able to maybe have a church ever of several hundred or seven, several thousand, but it does, those folks still need a man of God. And so it's been a joy and a lot of fun. I'm just a country boy, so it, it fits me. And I, en I enjoy pastoring down there. I'm going to have you turn to Acts chapter 28 tonight. Acts chapter 28. I do appreciate the, um, the opportunity to preach tonight and then to uh, hopefully have a good influence on the college students tomorrow. And uh, of course, Pat preached in my own pulpit this morning, drove up this afternoon. And uh, I love the Christmas season. I enjoyed the choir, uh, the band. We, we don't have anything like that, an orchestra. We got three old guys with kazoos, and uh, that's the only thing we... <laughs> so, uh, and, and a woman that plays the spoons, but besides that, we're a little, a little restricted in that area. So I, I, I had a time. That was fun. That was good. I told your preacher, I said, I always like to meet people that got the portion of musical talent that I was supposed to get. You know, I figure if God didn't give me any, then what I should have got went to someone. So uh, I hope you all are enjoying that because some of that came from me. And uh, have a good time with it. Amen. Acts chapter 28, we're going to begin reading verse number 1. And when they were escaped, and of course, those of you that understand where this chapter is placed, and, and you can glance back at chapter 27. Here Paul has just survived a storm, and that entire story, much detail there. But here they came in, verse 44, the last chapter, and the rest, some on board, some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass, they all escaped, all safe to land. And so the, that's the setting of what happens now, a shipwreck, and God's mercy and grace and when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said, among themselves. No doubt this man's a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked. And when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Bible. What a joy just to read it. It's a blessing to hear it read. Lord, what a remarkable story. So much to glean. 
So I pray, dear God, that through the Word of God and the preaching thereof, we would receive help tonight and encouragement, Lord. I love the Christmas season, but even in this month of celebration, the devil never takes any time off. And Lord, there's no doubt people that are going through or will so soon go through perhaps some type of a satanic attack. And Lord, it sure is good to have some instruction ahead of time to know how to properly and biblically respond to such things. So I want to be a blessing, Lord, above anything tonight. I want to be a blessing. So help me to be a help. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the Apostle Paul. I mean, he was an amazing man. A one and all out take no prisoner attitude. What an impact he made for our Savior in the brief 31 year ministry that God gave him. I mean, Paul was a soul winner, he was a church planter, Paul was an evangelist, Paul was a missionary, Paul was a discipler of new converts, new assemblies, and young preachers alike. He exploded into flames on the road to Damascus and burned fiercely till Nero's executioner put out his earthly light. But let me say this, today in heaven, Paul shines brighter than ever. Daniel 12, 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Paul also was the most persecuted, the most maligned, the most attacked, the most tormented of the twelve apostles. Paul shared this short account of the sufferings he had endured when he wrote to the church of Corinth. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, and labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths off. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, and journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in thirst and a hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, which come upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And here we find Paul in this last chapter of the book of Acts referencing one of those shipwrecks, that time he spent in the perils of the sea. We see him face a brand new test. He's already been through an awful lot. A new fresh attack of the devil. But in this story we learn from him how to handle, how to react with strength and with poise and to pass a test with flying colors when it comes to undergoing and having to face an attack of Satan. First of all, let me point out to you that the viper, if you haven't figured this out in our story, represents the devil himself. He's the diabolical enemy of God and of God's people. The viper in our story represents the prince and power of the air, the roaring lion, the red dragon, the father of all lies, the great deceiver. The viper represents Satan himself. Now we know this because way back in the first book of the Bible, Satan is portrayed in Genesis chapter 3 as a serpent sent to bring man to destruction. Now the serpent was more subtile than any beast of the field which God, the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Today we're going to take a little bit of time tonight and put the spotlight on this this one called the devil, Satan. I want to describe him to you. I want to decry him. We're going to use the scriptures to expose him for the dastardly, demonic deceiver that he is. Now, folks, listen to me. I want to help you with something. Don't think for one minute that the devil's only busy out in the crack house or the booze house or the whore house. I'm here to tell you the devil spends most of his time trying to wreak havoc in the church house. And I want to just point out some things because... You're doing a good work here, and wherever a good work is being done for the Lord Jesus Christ, there's going to be satanic attacks, both individually. Sometimes it's just a person that the devil selects out and chooses out and, and, and levels attacks against. Sometimes it's a family. I've watched preacher, a family unit in our church just seem like they get hit and hit and hit and hit, and they just go for a period of time where they're under a satanic attack. 
And oftentimes it's a church, a church family that goes through this together. And folks, listen to me. we got to know how to respond to these things. Because as long as you're pushing forward for the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, you might as well go buy a, church at, a shirt at Target because you're going to have a big bullseye on you as long as you're trying to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you got to know how to handle these things. I'm going to say this out loud. I want to tell you that I speak from some experience here. I want you to, I, I say this often, I'm going to say it tonight. You know what? I'm a declared enemy of the devil. Me and him are on opposite sides. I mean, we have no common ground. There's no place of agreement. I decided a long time ago that I was going to spend my life to try to do what he hates, and that's the, to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He hates the gospel. He hates the Lord Jesus. He hates any man, woman, or child that's for God. And you know what? I'm his enemy. He's mine. We only agree on one thing. I hate him, and he hates me. That's the only thing we agree on. I don't want to have any common ground with the devil. Hey, by the way, it's good for every one of us to just decide at some point to pick which side you're going to be on. All right. I mean, I mean, I'm his enemy. Every day I get up and do the, the best I can to steal his children. He don't like it. And so because of that, I've got to expect that he's going to retaliate. And folks, listen to me. Nowhere in the Bible, let me just say this, nowhere in the Bible will you find a verse, bring it to me if you can show it to me, where we're supposed to flee from the devil. And we're supposed to flee temptation. But doesn't the Bible tell us resist the devil and what? He shall flee from you. And I'm not talking about trying to resist the devil in my own strength, but good night, we have the Lord Jesus Christ. The name of Christ and the blood of Christ and the word of our testimony, we can have victory. I'm a little shocked at how so many Christians just seem to fold like a lawn chair anytime the devil comes and puts a little temptation, a little pressure on them. You know what? You better toughen up if you're going to be in this thing. Because we're at war, folks. We're at war every day of our lives with the devil and, and his cohorts. And so he's going to hit you, and he's going to hit you back. Uh, hit you hard sometimes, and we've got to know how to react to that. Now, let me just give you some practical teaching from this portion of Scripture. First of all, let me point out this. Notice when, notice when the viper attacked. Say, preacher, when did this viper attack? What's going on in Paul's life when he suffers this satanic attack? When did it happen? Watch this. It happens when Paul is already a prisoner, when Paul has just survived a storm, and when Paul has just survived a shipwreck. Now, if you ever think a guy was due to catch a break, you'd think that it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, he was due for one, wasn't he? Now watch this. You better figure this out. Young in your Christian life, don't think that the devil plays fair. Have you ever heard this statement, don't kick a man when he's down? Have you ever heard that statement before? Let me tell you something. The devil has never lived by that creed. He'll not only try to knock you down, but once he gets you down, he'll try to stomp the spiritual life out of you. You might as well understand that the, these attacks often come in groups, the Bible talks about, in, in uh, the diverse temptations in the book of James. The word diverse means manifold or many temptations or testings. One of the strategies of the devil devil is to concentrate his attacks upon an individual, a family, or a church. He'll deliver blow after blow after blow. Oftentimes these testings come one right after another. Yet notice the verse that I referenced in James. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I mean, here is Paul, a prisoner for the cause of Christ. He's just survived what the Bible calls an, a Euroclidon, a deadly counterclockwise hurricane that drives furiously from east to west. Not only that, but he has once again suffered a shipwreck that he survives only by the miraculous grace of God. Here he stands, wet, cold, physically exhausted, mentally drained, emotionally spent, spiritually taxed. I mean, you talk about a man that's down, and at that exact moment, here comes the attack of the viper. The devil attacked Paul again and again and again. When he was down, he tried to end him. Hey, Christians, watch this. Can I say this? I expect that from the devil. But can I just give a little sidebar, a little side note here? As a Christian, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. Preacher, from time to time I hear about a preacher going through a tough time or under the attack of the devil or some Christian or missionary or maybe a church that's under some type of satanic attack and 
Good thing, good night. If there's anything that we ought to do as Christians is root for each other, not join in the devil on the attack. I don't cluck my tongue when I hear about these things or shake my head or say, I seen it come, and I don't join in the devil and leveling accusations. Brother, listen, I want to help somebody that's under attack. I want to, if I can, lift them up. I'm, I mean, even if I just have to stand over them for a while and fight the devil for a while to get them a break so they can get back up on their feet. Hey, you know what, folks? The barbarians begin to cluck their tongue and make accusations against Paul when he was under satanic attack. Can I say this again? The barbarians do. That's what barbarians do. That's not supposed to be the behavior of God's people. If the devil attacks your, your pastor, I'm not, I'm not close to him. I'm, we're, we're not friends. We just met. But I'm going to tell you something, brother. I'll be in your corner with you if the devil comes after you. Because you know what? Thank God. I've been under those attacks. And thank God for good Christian brothers that came alongside me and helped me get through things. And by the way, can I say this to help you as a church family? That's one of the reasons you have a church family. You're supposed to watch out for each other. I mean, the attacks are going to come on this family. The attacks are going to come on maybe this wife or, or the children of this family. And good night, please tell me you don't join in the devil to do damage when that's happening. Tell me that there's enough Christianity in this place that you circle and circle that family and protect them and lift them up and love them. And folks, listen to me, we've got to do that for each other. But that's how the devil is. First of all, we've seen when the devil attacks. Now let's consider this. Why did the devil attack? Why did he attack? Let me just give you the simple answer. Paul was trying to help somebody. He was trying to help some people. In the previous chapter, we're told that there were 276 survivors. These barbarous people, the Bible says in verse 2, showed us no little kindness for they kindled a fire. But folks, we're talking about 276 people. I mean, that's a lot of cold, wet, exhausted, hungry people. And they just come in from the sea. And you know what? Paul is like most guys. I, I don't know what it is about guys and fire, but no matter what fire I've ever been around in my life, I never think it's big enough. <laughs> Every time we have a cookout or we have a bonfire, you know, no matter how big the fire is, there's always a couple little rednecks that's got to come over and just start throwing, chucking more wood on the fire. They just can't get it big enough. I mean, we're trying to have a weenie roast, and we're doing this number, you know, I mean. <laughs> come back looking like we've been in a, one of those tanning salons, you know, just trying to, trying to get our hot dog. Like, it's not going to be bigger. But, man, he's trying. I mean, there's 276 people. And you know what? He sees that little fire, and he looks at And by the way, this is the difference between them. We talked about a pastor, sorry. This is the difference between people that are wired to help others and those that are just along for the ride is, you know, the Apostle Paul was in the same condition they were. He was cold. He was wet. He was exhausted. But you know what? He didn't think about that. He looked around and said, thank God for that fire, but it's not big enough. And you know what? These people need some warmth. They need some help right now. And so Paul, watch this, folks. There's a spiritual lesson here. Paul was determined to build a bigger fire. I like a guy like this. I like somebody that's always wanting to make something bigger. I think in every good pastor and every effective leader, there has to be a touch of pyromaniac. <laughs> I like a big fire. I like it. I like a bus captain that takes a route and says, you know what, I want to grow this route. I like a Sunday school teacher that says, I want to grow this route. You know what, are you a maintainer or are you a builder? But you know what, I believe that, that if you've got a heart for people, you're going to want to do something and you're going to build something bigger. Listen, Paul wasn't doing this so he could add to some type of, of reputation. He, he was wanting to build a bigger, not, not to make a name for himself, not so he could beat himself on the chest and say, my fire is bigger than your fire. He was building this fire because people were in need. People were in need. A fire produces three things, folks. It produces light. You are the light of the world. You know what the world needs? They need us to build a bigger fire because we need a brighter light. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hit. A fire produces heat in this old cold world. There needs to be somewhere where people can come in and warm themselves. By the way, heat is good, especially this time of year. Heat is good. Warmth is always well received to those suffering from the frigid dark winds to this uh, of this unkind and uncaring world. And let me just say this, we need a warm place. We need a place that's bright. And you know what? If you've got fire, you can provide nourishment. You know, the Bible talks about the milk of the Word, and 
and it likens the Bible to the bread, the, good, the bread of life, and then likens it to strong meat. And let me just say this, folks, watch this. The reason we ought to try to build things big isn't so that we can add to a reputation, but because there is a lost and dying world that's in trouble. And you know what? They need people that have a vision to go farther and build larger. I, and I don't understand the spiritualization of the small anymore. It's almost like we've got this, this crazy pendulum that swung back over this way now, and now almost people are proud to be a failure. They're proud to do nothing. They want to pat themselves on the back as if it's a mark of spirituality not to reach anyone. Good night, folks. We're not doing it to build ourselves some kind of reputation. We're doing it because people are dying and going to hell. The devil's wreaking havoc in this world. And so you know what? Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in from the fields of sin. And so that's who, that's who the devil attacks. He attacks. He's always going to go after a church that's trying to reach more people. He's always going to go after the bus captain that gets a burden and a heart for people. He's always going to go after the Sunday school teacher that reaches out beyond the normal and goes farther and, and works harder. I mean, listen, if you're going to try to, to help people, the devil's going to come after you and he's going to come after your family. Now, we've got to be careful. Because also, all, all, um, the honest truth is that, you know, those of us that have been this way and we're wired this way, we understand that by doing these things, we are inviting an attack of the devil. We've got to be very careful that we don't guard, that we guard against this circle the wa wagons mentality that we're seeing a lot of Christians and a lot of churches develop. It's almost like, you know what? We're not popular anymore, and the, the culture's swinging a certain way, and what we better do is maybe we just ought to, you know, circle the wagons, go into a defensive position, and hunker down till Jesus comes. And folks, we can't afford to do that. I mean, if there's ever a time where the church of Jesus Christ needs to be energized and excited and have a vision and go forward, it's now! It's now. So thank God for a man that just said, I'm going to build a bigger fire. Now I want to point out last of all this. Notice how the viper attacked. Let's look at the scriptures here. Verse number three, and when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, they came a viper out of the heat and fastened, watch this, fastened on his hand. It goes on to say in verse number four, when the barbarians, barbarians saw the venomous beast, notice this phrase, hang hang on his hand. They said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer. The viper came, first of all, out of the heat. Look right up here, church. Let me help you. I didn't start this thing yesterday. I've been in the ministry now 30 years. I'm just going to say something that's accurate and honest and warn you against it. Most of the satanic attacks that have come against churches and preachers throughout the years have not come from without. They've come from within. And this viper came out of the fire, out of the heat. Listen to me. Look right up here. Don't be that person. Don't be the person that the devil convinces that you're doing God's work by deciding you're going to try to hurt or destroy or attack your own church. Don't be that person. Because if you do, you are deceived of the devil. The viper came out of the heat. The viper attacked before the crowd. This was a very public attack. You know, brother, sometimes attacks come privately, and, you know, our people don't even know that we're facing certain things, and the honest truth is a good shepherd, a good pastor is probably never going to let you know those things. Pray for your pastor. Would you agree to do that? Pray for your pastor. I promise you this, and again, I'm not a woe is me pastor. I think we got the greatest job in all of the world, but brother, I'm going to tell you something. I was raised a PK. You know what that means? Preacher's kid. I was raised up in a in a in the family of a, a preacher, and I've I've watched behind the scenes, and I've been in the ministry for 30 years, and I can tell you this: your pastor, your good pastor, and his wife and family suffer satanic attacks that you'll never know about. Because you know what? The last thing he wants to do is bring something that the devil's trying to bring into his life to hurt him. He doesn't want that to hurt the church. So he deals with private things. And by the way, sometimes you as good Christians deal with private, private attacks of the devil. But this wasn't a private attack, brother. This is the toughest kind. I mean, this venomous beast didn't just reach out and nail him and then go back into the fire. This venomous beast grabbed a hold and hung on to him. 
And I can see the Apostle Paul dropping that big bundle of sticks and all of a sudden he raises a hand and can you hear the gasps and can you hear the, the, the murmurings begin because and a few, maybe a few ladies scream and, and there's a, a venomous snake and it's hanging on him, it's hanging on him. It's a very public thing. It's a very public thing. The viper attacked with deadly intent. This was a venomous beast. Listen, he wasn't playing around. He was trying to kill the Apostle Paul. Let's apply this story to where you're at. Satan hates what's going on here. There's a good work of God going on in this property. He hates it. At some point, he's going to come out of the fire and he's going to, that you're trying to build for God, and he's going to attack you. I'm sure he's already done it in the past, and I'm sure he's planning more things in the future because he doesn't quit. Let me just say this, folks. This time of year, for a lot of people, are tough times. Children don't always understand this. To them, Christmas just represents happiness and joy and gifts and anticipation of what they're, they're going to enjoy. And, and they don't realize and understand sometimes why grandma, grandpa, mom, and dad may be over in the corner shedding a silent tear. But the older that you are and the more that you've lived, holidays don't just bring joy. There's heartache and there's memories and there's empty places at the table. And it's amazing during this time of the year how many times the devil attacks he attacks. I don't know what you're facing right now, but let me just say this. The devil oft times will try to attack you very publicly. And you know what? Then all of a sudden the barbarians, they start making accusations. And people start talking. Crazy things are said. I don't know about you, but in my young Christian life, I felt like I need to go answer everything. I need to go talk to everybody. I, uh, people are misunderstanding. The, the real story's not out, and I felt like I needed to always defend myself. And then one day I came to this story, and I saw Paul. And you know what? All the murmurings, all the whisperings, all the accusations, this man's a murderer. Escape the sea, and you know what? Vengeance has come. God's got him in it. And you know what? He hurt that. And it hurts. You hear those kind of things? It hurts. But you know what? We're talking about a veteran man of God here. And you know what he does? Watch this. Preacher, how do you survive? I mean, how do you survive a, a viper attack? You know what Paul did, did, did do and did not do? Number one, Paul did not begin to blame God. Folks, listen to me. Isn't it sad that that's the first reaction of so many Christians when they go under the attack of the devil? Now think about this and think it through. Who is attacking you? The devil is doing the attacking, and yet we get mad at God. That's crazy to me. If you look at Madison, why get mad at the devil? He didn't try to answer his accusers. By the way, he didn't run away from the fire. Listen, when you're going through a satanic attack, it's not time to get out of church. It's not time to stop your, your, uh, working on your bus route, to stop teaching your Sunday school class. You say, preacher, what did he do? What Paul did was he used the heat of the fire he was building to destroy the viper. And you know what he did? He took that old, that old snake and he just held it over the heat until that fire withered it. And then you know what I believe the Apostle Paul went back to doing while everybody was murmuring and looking and watching what's going to happen. Apostle Paul just goes over and gets more wood and just keeps building the fire. And you know what I, I believe? I believe that the devil attacks us because he wants us to stop building the fire. And if I stop, then he won. Now, I'm going to tell you how Jerry Ross thinks about this, and maybe it's crazy. But I'm just kind of, you know, got a, a little bit of a Chicago mentality about this. All right, we're at war, right? So he hits me, I'm going to hit him back. Okay, he brings a knife, I bring a gun. It's the Chicago way, all right there. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I, that's how I think. Okay, the devil attacks. Oh, I'm going to quit. What? Counterattack. Devil hurt some of my people and hurt some of God's children. And you know what? Let's go get some of his children. 
I mean, let's steal them right out of his backyard. You know what? Listen, I believe this. Every time the devil, you look at my record, you'll see this. Every time the devil has, has launched either a personal attack on me or a attack on my church, you know what I do? I go in my office and I start planning a counterattack. I'm going to hit him back. I'm going to hit him back. Listen. You get attacked by the devil, the preacher, but it's public and people heard and people are saying this and it's not, you know what? Just go soul winning. Just decide I'm going to spend some extra time on my bus route. Just go be a blessing to somebody. Hey, start a new visitation program. Open up a new area. Launch a, a, a new counterattack. Listen, it's not time to quit. Listen, folks, this matter of being attacked by the devil, if you're going to be in this long term, I mean, it's just part of it. All right. I mean, these veteran preachers and these veteran church, core church members that have been in this thing for the long haul, you can't see it, but there's battle scars all over their body because this is what it is. You know what we need to determine ahead of time before that attack comes? The devil attacks. I'm not running away. I'm not getting bitter. I'm not blaming God. I'm not quitting. I'm just going to shake him off into the fire, let people talk, let people say what they want to, and I'm just going to grab some more sticks and build the fire. And by the way, those barbarians stared, stared at him for a while, and they watched for a while, and they looked, and then you know what happened? They changed their mind. Now, you talk about fickle. One time, one moment, they're telling, say, telling everybody he's a murderer, and the next time they're telling him there's a, he's a god. I mean, you know, there's the two extremes, but they're barbarians. Let me just say this, folks. You just stick it there. I'm talking about that lady that's in this auditorium. And you know what? Right now you're suffering a satanic attack. You just hang in there. Talk about that man. You know what? You love God. You're doing the best you can. The devil just won't. He's got you down. He won't let you get up. Listen, you just hang in there. Just keep, keep pitching wood on the fire. I'm talking about that college student. You know what? This is a tough time of year. And the devil's already got some of you about half talked into going home and not coming back. You going to let the devil win? Are you, are, really, honestly, is that all there is to you? Come on, you better toughen up. You better grow some thick skin. Because if you're going to be in this thing, it's a lifetime battle. It's a lifetime war. Get used to it. Tough it out. Go home, reload, rest up, get back here, and go back to war with the devil. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this story, Lord. It's helped this preacher many times in my life, dear God, and I hope it... It helps a few people here tonight. Bless this good work, this good ministry, Lord. Thank you, dear God, that tucked away all over, dear God, this country. There's some faithful men and faithful church members. And Lord, old-time religion's not dead. Seems like everybody keeps trying to plan the funeral of old-time religion, but the corpse won't show up. They're just out there doing what they've always done, just knocking on doors, loving people, preaching the gospel, taking a stand, living for God, soul winning, running buses, Lord, may it always be so. But Lord, we do understand that with that comes attacks. And I pray, Lord, that this little story will come to mind in the midst of a battle, in the midst of attack, Lord, and we'll mimic a veteran Christian, great missionary, great preacher, who was faithful to the end, he was able at the end to say, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. He did it right. Help us, Lord, to react with maturity to satanic attacks. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The